How many of you have heard of Anna Karenina? Great, novel by Leo Tolstoy. Uh, Late, takes place in late 19th century Russia. For those of you who haven't read it, I'm going to give the cocktail version, uh, cocktail party version of this talk. So the three things that you need to know about Anna Karenina to talk about it at a cocktail party. Uh, the first thing is that this book is incredibly long. It's a massive doorstopper of a book. So if you buy it and you don't actually read it, you'll at least uh, work out your arms like this lady here. Um, the second thing to know about this book is its very famous opening lines, which is that happy families are all alike, but that every unhappy family is unhappy in its own particular way. And now I'm talking too fast. Um, you would think, for those of you who are familiar with the plot line, you would think that this quote is actually talking about Anna's family. Um, so the main plot point is Anna Karenina, beautiful, well-connected, top of Russian society, uh, she's a woman who eventually cheats on her husband, gives everything up for love, and then throws herself underneath a train. It's pretty depressing. Um, her lover, by the, by the way, is named Count Vronsky. But if the story is that quickly told, why, why, why is it so long? Um, one answer is that Tolstoy packs a lot into this novel. He talks about politics, economics, religion, philosophy, art. There's bear hunting and horse racing and a seance, um, but most of all, and most importantly, there's love and sex. The second answer is that Anna's story only comprises about less than half of the novel, actually. How many of you have heard of Constantine Levin? Okay, he's the novel's second most important character. Some might argue equally important character in the novel. And compared to Anna, he starts off the novel in kind of a low position. He's a bit of a country bumpkin. He's a country gentleman. Um, He's in her social circle, but when the novel starts, he comes into town, the big, big city, to ask Kitty Scherbatsky to marry him, and he gets rejected. He flees back to the country, but oh, happy story. Over the course of the novel, he ends up marrying Kitty. They have a baby boy, and at the very, very end of the novel, he's worked through a lot of important spiritual and existential questions. So he really ends on this huge high note. Okay. And that's really the narrative structure of the novel, if we're giving the Cliff Notes version here, is that Anna starts at the top, ends up under a train, Levin starts at the bottom, ends up in this great happy place. And so it's really these two competing visions of love that Tolstoy offers us. One, this all-consuming, fiery passion of Anna's. Um, where, you know, she and Vronsky, she gives up everything for Vronsky, her husband, her son, her position in society. Um, and it's really this all-consuming, passionate love affair. Secondly is Levin's version, or Levin's vision of love, which is absolutely the one that Tolstoy himself agreed with, which is a, a marriage based on mutual respect, forgiveness, love, a house in the country, a baby boy. And so it begs the question, it seems quite obvious that we would all prefer a long and happy marriage to death underneath a train. Um, but there's something so compelling about Anna. There's a reason why we remember her and not Levin. There's a reason why Tolstoy named the novel after her. Um, and that's doomed tragic love affairs have an exercise, a huge hold over our imaginations. Romeo and Juliet, Tristan and Isolde, um, Caesar and Cleopatra, the next two slides, uh, Jack and Rose, doomed, tragic love affairs. Why are they so potent? Why are they so powerful when we don't want to end up underneath trains? Um, and so I want to close, actually, with an excerpt from another wonderful novel, The Unbearable Lightness of Being by Milan Kundera. And so Kundera actually talks about Anna um, in his own novel. Um, and what I haven't told you is that Anna starts the novel and meets Vronsky at a railway station. Um, she meets him near a train, and someone kills himself by throwing himself underneath the train. And so Kundera argues that this symmetrical composition in the novel is not unrealistic. It's not untrue to life. It's not untrue to the way that our lives are actually formed. And he argues that we need to be alive to these fortuitous occurrences in our own lives and to these mysterious coincidences um, because that's the way that our own lives have this beauty. And so I would challenge you to think about your own fortuitous occurrences, to find the own motifs in your own life, to find the things that keep recurring, and in doing so, to give yourself that dimension of Anna's beauty and that potency of Anna Karenina um, without throwing yourself underneath a train.